but we are live. We've got a package today from One Bits Card. All right, let's uh, open this carefully around the cat. All right, we have a box. I think the box is safe. All right, we got some bubble wrap. Oh, wow, we got a bunch of Pimons. Oh, this is cool. I didn't realize you were sending so much, uh, um, so many objects. This is great. So we got some extra headers. So Pmod, I don't remember if it stands for anything. Maybe it's just like peripheral module or something. It's just a standard that I think Digilent started doing, but it's just like a really simple 0.1 inch header layout. So a lot of people started, um, started using it. So yeah, got some LEDs, icebreaker Pmods. Got some, got some switches. Everything here is eight bits. Eight bits per Pmod. Oh yeah. This is for driving LED panels. Ribbon cable here. And then this is the actual board. Icebreaker 1.0A. So I think the numbering there is such that um, you can combine PMOD 1A and 1B into a double width peripheral, and then refer to that as PMOD 1. But then PMOD 2 is also available if you separate that. Piot mentions that this extended PMOD plus 5 volts plus PMOD is a standard that uh, him and uh, Kevin Hubbard have worked out. So yeah, the idea behind this is it has just like a couple of really basic things built in so that you can get started. And then it has the standard add-on interfaces, the PMODs. So it's got the FTDI interface. This is an FT2232H, um, which has multiple high-speed ports that you can use for various purposes. In this case, by default, one of them is a high-speed serial port, but you can also set it up as various kinds of parallel or other interfaces. Um, and then the other one's a JTAG port that you can use to program the FPGA itself. That's the FPGA. And then this is the non-volatile storage, the flash memory. Piot points out that you can even run MicroPython on here. That's pretty great. Is that only with the built-in RAM, or do you need external RAM to run MicroPython? That's pretty amazing. RGB LED. These headers down here are a bit more special purpose. This is specifically an output that's um, being driven by transistors that can handle, you know, like 25 milliamps. Um, on here, it's labeled for driving RGB LEDs. There are probably a lot of things you could do with that, though. Um, and this is kind of a debug header that you can use for the flash memory interface. But then these three are kind of general purpose peripheral interfaces. Oh, interesting. Piot also points out that these FPGAs have a one-time programmable flash memory built in. So in addition to the RAM that it normally runs out of, you can also just program a design in permanently. All right, backside. So yeah, a little bit more labeling for those same headers. Um, we've got some jumpers here for setting looks like how it boots. Oh, and then these are optional for attaching additional FTDI pins to the FPGA so that you can use some of the fancier FTDI modes. Oh, and we've got test points for access to the USB. That's handy. This one's actually a model I haven't used, the UP5K, I think it's called. So this one's a little bit bigger than the one on the ice stick, if you're familiar with that one. One thing that this board is, is really, I think, focused on trying to give people an interesting experience on just a single thing. So you don't need a separate programmer. You can add add-ons. It has these kind of standard PMOD headers, which have, I think, eight general purpose IOs and power, all at 3.3 volts. So you can do that, but it also has this little like kind of break off piece that has built in LEDs and, uh, um, and buttons. Have internal oscillators, PLLs. Wow, hard SPI cores. That's interesting. There's the flash we were looking at, 16 megabytes. And there's this is effectively a PMOD that's built in. You can use this separately, or you can leave it attached and it's connected straight through. And this looks pretty similar to the LED pattern that you might have seen on like the ice stick. So I wonder if that's actually compatible. Cool, so it looks like it comes up with a nice like LED blinky kind of demo. Is that a gray code counter? That's cool. Nice organized schematic, easy to read. We've even got the FPGA split up into pieces, which is cool. Um, 
These banks can be important if you need to speak at multiple I.O. voltages. You can set up um, each bank with a different power supply. So in fact, that's supported with these jumpers. If you need, for example, 1.8 volt I.O., you could move this jumper from 3.3 .3 to 1.8, and then all of these would be 1.8 volts, which is pretty useful if you have like memory that operates at that speed, for example, or at that voltage. Um, so the clock oscillator, that is shared with, um, with the FTDI is that. That's this one. FTDI clock is the net name. So this is the board we have. This is Piot's icebreaker. That's uh, so named as to kind of break the ice for folks that are new to FPGAs. And this is a summary of what's on the chip. It's got these multiplier units, which might be pretty great. Um, it's got a built-in pulse width modulator and these these PWM these LED drivers, which I assumed were external transistors. That's actually on the FPGA too, which is neat. It's got some RAM, some more RAM, and then this FT2232H is the high-speed variant of this chip, so it can go up to the full USB 2 400, 480 megabits. So that's pretty great. It's an FTDI chip, and you might have bad feels about FTDI as a manufacturer, but like it is still a pretty great way of um, adding a high-speed USB interface that doesn't require a lot of like software or driver support to some other bit of hardware that doesn't natively have USB, like a CPU without USB built in, or in this case, an FPGA. If you're familiar with the usual FTDI serial adapters, like these little dongles, this is the FT232 chip usually. But then there are some other variants of it that have not just a single serial port, but multiple serial ports. And there are some where the serial ports can be configured as either a serial or a parallel interface. And so this is one of those where you can use it for serial or parallel. You can also kind of select among many different built-in protocols. And I think you can find this by Googling for Icebreaker FPGA already. There's the link to the crowd supply and the GitHub here. And yeah, cool. This is the board that we are using today. It has this lovely snap-off section. This this whole project called Ice Storm, which was originally built around the Lattice Ice 40 FPGAs, which just happened to be this line of um, small and inexpensive and low power and relatively simple FPGAs that made a good target to reverse engineer and build this kind of clean room tool chain implementation around. So just using public documentation and like black box reverse engineering, uh, these folks mostly, you know, I think mostly Clifford was involved in ICE40, although other folks have been working on other, uh, uh, other chips and other chip families. Um, and I certainly don't know the full list of contributors. That's certainly, uh, you know, something you should check out on, on GitHub since all of this is open source and all the, um, all the reverse engineering work is actually really well documented. I think Clifford did a really great job at making something which was both machine readable and human readable as a product from the reverse engineering. Uh, so that's actually what this ice storm um, project itself has is the deliverable is this database of reverse engineered information for how these chips are constructed or at least how they are programmed you know how the how the um, logic elements are actually arranged on the chip and how you would direct them to have a particular behavior um, where all the normal elements are where all the special elements are where all the routing is so that's, that's the open source tool chain here. Um, and that's kind of one motivation a lot of people have to use this particular chip or other chips that have an open source tool chain. There's just a lot more flexibility that you have in having this whole tool chain be available to kind of poke around on and modify and inspect if you want. Whereas traditional FPGA tool chains are actually like notoriously annoying and proprietary and full of licensing nonsense. And so yeah, these things uh, I think are improved significantly by having a tool chain which is open source, but also coincidentally, like small and fast and pretty easy to use. There are a lot of reasons that um, I and other people have to be excited about these tools. So, uh, you know, some of us respond to that excitement by uh, like, you know, playing with these boards and designing things. And some people like uh, Piot, who's here in chat uh, at Esden, uh, he's, he's responding to this excitement by building tools that educators can use to bring these uh, FPGAs and really just like FPGAs and digital logic in general to more people. So um, on Monday, he sent in this, or rather, it arrived on Monday, he sent in this care package last week, which uh, arrived for us on Monday, which contained one of the prototype icebreaker boards here um, in the, uh, I think this is Osh Park purple, correct me if I'm wrong. The lighting here is a little weird, but that looks like, looks pretty Osh Parky. Um, 
but then there's this whole suite of tools, like there's a, a Verilog synthesizer called Yosis, and there are a couple of different place and route tools at this point. And yeah, a lot of the tools have this kind of ICE naming scheme. Even some of the tools that are not necessarily specific to this ICE40 FPGA, I guess, kind of take on this name. Um, like ICE Studio, the program that we're going to be using today. It's a graphical front end that um, gives you you know, something that's akin to like the Arduino IDE for dealing with these FPGAs. Yeah, and then Piotr also points out the pun here is that the icebreaker, it also, you know, besides having this naming scheme that kind of matches everything else in this family of tools, it's also meant to break the ice for people who are new to FPGAs. So it's got everything you need on one board. You don't need any separate programming tools. Um, you don't need any separate USB interface. I mean, he's also annoying and destructive, but he's really good. He likes that warm scope. Don't chew on that time base knob, knob Tuco. He wants to chew on this knob that adjusts the horizontal. I know it. It's his kind of knob. Camera did an alright job at following. I'm surprised Tuco's put up with this for this long. Where do you want to go?